this is one I wish somebody taught me. Make sure you fail. Okay, you have to fail. If you don't fail, you're not trying. I know it sounds cliche, but it's better to aim high and miss than to aim low and hit. You have to learn from your failures. You can learn from other people's failures. You can't be afraid to fail. You're not going to learn anything if you always do everything right. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation and we have with us Vic Parangelo, who is the regional manager at ProSoft. So welcome, Vic. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Man, I'm excited to have you on the show, man. Been, been looking forward to working with you. And uh, I know you've had some exciting things throughout your career. And we love to get these hero conversations started, Vic, by just hearing about your journey to where you're at now, man. Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, Chris, going back to when I was three years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. Right. And uh, I'm sure a lot of other little boys do want it too. But I was well on my way until the, the Challenger in 1986. So that kind of changed my mind a little bit. And I decided to just stick with being a pilot. But later on in the early 90s, I had a job offer at the Kodak Federal Systems, which was up in uh, Rochester, New York, doing work on aerial surveillance drones out of Hancock Air Force Base. So I had spent enough, enough time in the sand, I, so I chose the frozen winter wonderland of Rochester, New York at Kodak, where I was able to earn my master's degree at night. So it's interesting, my background in mechanical and aerospace engineering ultimately led me to a career you know, in various aspects of automation, mostly tied to military or semiconductor projects. You know, during the past 20, 25 years, I've only really worked for two companies, one company called Anorad in New York on Long Island, and another one called Aerotech based out of Pittsburgh. Now, both of these companies stayed on the cutting edge of ultra high precision industrial automation going back to 1970. I was surrounded by a lot of smart people. I was privileged to work with and learn from the brightest military civilian minds in the field. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's great. And so I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you have a, a jet as your background image. So I'm guessing that's not by chance. No, that's, that's what I lived to do. And um, it was another lifetime. Right, right. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> now, where'd you, where did you go to school at for your undergrad? So I went to, to the Air Force Academy. Okay, awesome. Yeah, man. I, and the joke I tell everybody is I graduated high school on Sunday in June and by Tuesday morning, I was doing push-ups in the mud. <laughs> right. Born at sea level, and now I'm doing push-ups in the mud at uh, 7,250 feet in Colorado Springs. I hear you, man. Well, thank you for your service, first and foremost, man. That's awesome. My privilege. Well, Vic, you know, you with your experience, and you have a lot of ex you know, experience working in industry, what are you hearing out there? What are you seeing is changing that maybe industry is going to be challenged with in the future? I think right now, I think the greatest challenge is the rapid rate of change. The best example of this would be something like companies like Intel and Moore's Law, right? Think about it. You've got 18 months to overcome the challenges of doubling your capability and capacity, right? And as soon as you make that achievement, the clock starts again on the next doubling. So it's an exponential growth curve, right? You've got to run as fast as you can just to stand still. Not everyone can handle that challenge. You know, some can. That's right. You know, and then add to that the task of revenue generation, right? Every time you hit a breakthrough or you meet or exceed a quota, you know, it's immediately old news because you've got another quota or another target to hit next month. You know, next you're month. the king of the hill on December 31st. And on January 1st, everybody's reset to zero. It can be a wild ride. No doubt, man. No doubt. On to the next one, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> you can never celebrate for too long. Right. What'd you do for me lately? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Now, how about, or speak to the young people who, who are wanting to, to pursue a career in industry. What advice would you give? Maybe what's some advice that you wish somebody would have gave you that you didn't get? The couple. I think the biggest one is that you need to keep learning. Remember, 
I didn't pick up on this when it happened, but when you graduate high school or college, that's called commencement, right? Which means a beginning, a start. You got to keep moving forward. Uh, you can't rest on your laurels of what you did yesterday, right? No, no matter what awards you've won, right? What level you achieved, you, you always have to keep your eye on the next challenge. I mean, the next level. Most good employers, you know, they'll spend a lot of money to make sure you know how to do your job or to have you do the job better. Just, you gotta keep learning, that's number one. Number two, and lastly, you gotta focus. Don't confuse being busy with being productive. Don't allow yourself to get sidetracked by secondary activity that doesn't serve you. We all feel like we have unlimited time. You don't. You got that right, that's definitely a scarce commodity. I love your failure point, I mean, because you're right, that's where you really grow as a person, yeah. as a professional, is, is, is in those moments. You got to be able to get knocked down and pick yourself back up. And be comfortable being uncomfortable. I've been telling people that lately. Yes. Very good, man. So when you look back over your career, have there been people who have been mentors to you who have spoken positive things into your life that you'd like to uh, recognize? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about it, so many people have influenced me and, and, and I can appreciate, I can learn something from everybody. Uh, but there are two people that really stick out. One of them is my dad, and another one is a guy named Charlie Zellman. He actually lives in Raleigh. They're both the same age right now. They're both in their mid-80s. My dad, he was a New York City cop for 20 years, and I could tell he didn't like his job. You know, he retired 20 years to the day, you know, but he saw the big picture, right? You know, he provided for his family. The thing that sticks with me the most is an idea where he said, you need to enjoy your work. He said, it doesn't matter if you're like a street sweeper or the president. He said, find something that you love to do it better than anybody else and have someone pay you to do it, right? So, you know, on that note, I joined the military to fly jets, which is pretty much what I wanted to do. He wasn't so happy about that. My mom wasn't so happy about that. But... And then Charlie Zellman, he was the national sales manager at Aerotech for 40 years. He taught me the value of interacting with people. And I remember he said to me, you could have an IQ of 200, but if you don't know how to work with people, you're screwed. <laughs> He's like, he was a brilliant engineer. He was a very effective salesman and he was a people person. He's a great teacher and a friend and still is. But he pulled me out of the engineer's cubicle and put me front and center on stage where the spotlight is on you. No doubt. It sounds like that's just two wonderful mentors that, that have guided and helped you you know, grow to, to where you're at now. Yeah. Yeah. I owe them a lot. They, they imparted wisdom. That's That's great. Now, when you think about engineering and the role that you're in now, and you said they took you out of that cubicle and put you in the spotlight. Sometimes there's a myth around engineering or sales in general, right? They're not always positive types of myths either. So if you get a chance to debunk something here, what would it be? Yeah, no, there's definitely a few. And, and I think I'm living proof. So, uh, Engineers aren't all uh, cubicle-dwelling geeks with debatable social skills, right? Not all of us. We're above average intelligence. We don't all love math. We're not all men. There's a lot of women engineers. And we don't all like Star Trek. <laughs> don't all like Star Now, that's a new one I've heard on that one, okay? <laughs> you kind of caught me off guard with that one, Vic. That was good stuff, man. So how about this? When, when you're at work and you're doing the work that you enjoy the most and it's bringing you just so much joy and you're feeling fulfillment. What are you doing in those moments? So I get the most fulfillment at work when someone brings me a hard problem and they come to me to solve it. And I already know the solution because I've already solved it for somebody else. A silly example. You know, when I was in high school, I remember I applied to eight colleges and I got into seven. The one that I didn't get into was Princeton, but it didn't really matter because, you know, I got into the Air Force Academy. I went to the Air Force Academy. But many years later, I started to wonder, like, why didn't I get into Princeton? Just why? As a salesman, you never mind losing an order as long as you know why you lost the order. Because you learn from that for the next sale. So it was bugging me because I didn't know why. So as it turns out, over the years, I was doing a lot of work with Princeton's engineering department. And little by little, you know, the professors got to know me and I was solving their problems. And then I had already worked on similar problems in industry. So it was like that. But some of these professors even asked me to guest lecture their classes from time to time. 
So it was like it came full circle, right? On an earlier failure. I originally failed selling myself as an undergraduate, but now here I am teaching there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was pretty fulfilling. No I, doubt. I, <laughs> that was a great story, man. How about any highlights? Anything that you look back on, you've had such an impressive career. Anything that stands out is like, man, that was really cool when I was part of it. With so many things, Chris, I look at it more as a big picture. The highlights of my career has been and continue to be traveling and living all over the world and not paying for it. I mean, I've been all over the Middle East. I've been all over Europe and the Americas. I like to travel. I love to sell. And I'm very comfortable talking to strangers. There you go. Okay. Now, Vic, with these hero conversations, we like to uh, get off the career path and have a little fun outside to learn, just to learn about you and to share that with our listeners. So what hobbies do you have, man? What do you enjoy doing for fun? The hobby I do the most is fishing, and I didn't really choose it. It chose me. Okay. I mean, growing up, as far as I can remember, we always had a boat on Long Island, and my dad and I were on it all the time. We would start fishing around St. Patrick's Day, and we would end the fishing season somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas, as long as the fish and the weather cooperated. So if either one of them wasn't there, then we were done. But, you know, fishing reminds me of my childhood, hanging out with my dad on the boat, staring up at the sky, watching the airplanes go by. You know, some of my, I remember some of my friends' parents had big boats, 40, 50 footers. So we'd head out 100 miles out to the canyon, offshore. And we caught some big stuff, like two, 300 pound shark and tuna. That was crazy. Man, that sounds awesome, man. Fun times, fun times. Now, how about, we also love to share, you've already shared about your dad. What else would you like to share with our listeners about your family? So, you know, my wife, she's my rock. You know, she, she keeps me in line. She wears the pants. Uh, my kids are awesome. You know, my, my oldest daughter, she's a sophomore in college. My son's a senior in high school. I feel, feel kind of bad. My daughter just missed the COVID thing, right? So everything was normal for her. And my son was is in the middle of it now. My youngest, my youngest, she's she's in preschool. And I'm telling you, she's smarter than all of us combined. <laughs> <laughs> so you have college, high school, and preschool. Yes. Okay. That's a pretty big yeah. span there. Yeah. yeah. It keeps me young, Chris. I hear you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> because the older two don't know my name anymore. They're like, who? Uh, they could drive. They don't need me anymore. <laughs> they can drive. Well, make sure they know this is called a hero conversation for a reason. Just remind them of that, Vic. Oh, don't worry. They come to me when they need something. <laughs> That's right. They just need less. <laughs> well, it sounds like you got a wonderful family, man. That's awesome. And best of luck to your older kids as they, they go through college. They got a great role model in you to learn from, man. Thank you. Very good. So how about when you think through the stuff you consume on a regular basis? It could be podcasts or you know, YouTube channels, books. Is there anything that you find value in? I mean, and this could be stuff that you just enjoy for Vic or stuff that you enjoy for work. Just just like to share that. So as far as podcasts go, I got to be honest with you, Chris, I never really listened to any podcasts until I discovered Eco Ask Why. It's really the only podcast I listen to. Okay. But I'm more of a YouTube guy. So I like these guys, some of it's old school, but there's some names like Evan Carmichael, Motivation Hub. You probably heard of Les Brown, Jim Rohn, right? And even like really old school, like Earl Nightingale. I, I like these guys because they give great personal and professional advice. And it's like straight up in your face. The theme is always the same. It's no one's coming to save you. It's up to you. Your, your successes and your failures are all on you. Don't point the finger at anybody else. And ultimately, when you know what you want and you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. You know, so something that I've always wrestled with when I talk to people, whether it's my wife or my kids, or, you know, family, friends, I've always known what I wanted, right? I told you from three years old, I want to be an astronaut and I wanted to fly. And, you know, I'll ask somebody, what, what do you want? What do you want for dinner? What, what do you want? And a lot of people just don't know. No, and that's okay. That's okay. Like, I think it was Jim Rowan that said it. When you know what you want, and you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. But if you don't know what you want, how do you, what do you do, right? No doubt, man. That's good stuff, buddy. Good stuff. 
Well, and we also have been doing, Vic, this has been fun for me, and I think our listeners are enjoying this, just a lightning round, just to get to know you a little bit more. Some things that, that could be random, just, just fun stuff, man. So if you're down, we'll play the game. Yeah. All right, man. We'll start. I like starting easy. So what's your favorite food? Pizza. All right. Pizza. New York style? Uh, yeah. Sicilian. There you go. There you go. How about uh, adult beverage, man? Any IPA. Any, okay, any IPA. Now, if you had any to, IPA. if you had to narrow it down to to one or two, anything jumps out. Voodoo Ranger. Voodoo Ranger. Okay, okay. It tastes like tangerine. It doesn't even taste like beer. It's like you're you're drinking tangerine juice <laughs> in an IPA. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, try it. I had to try that out. I had to try that. Out. How about uh, all time favorite movie? Usual Suspects or uh, Sixth Sense. I like any movie that has a hairy twist at the end, and I didn't see it coming. I got you. I got you. Okay. <laughs> you had me fooled. I thought you were going to go with Top Gun or something, man. I, I wasn't sure. No, no. it's funny you say that. Top Gun is great, but I was like, I was before Top Gun, so it was like cool, but I think if I had been after Top Gun, then I would have said yes. I got you. I got you. Okay. How about favorite music? Anything 80s. Anything right? 80s. All right. Now. 80s hair band, right? 80s, uh, even 80s, like... Uh, ballads, anything 80s. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna make you focus here. So, what's your favorite 80s uh, hair band? You gotta pick one. Cinderella. Cinderella. Okay. Cool. They man. have crazy hair. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say Van Halen back in the David Lee Roth days, but I think Cinderella has crazier hair. <laughs> True. <laughs> nice, nice. How about uh, destination, man? Somewhere you want you want to go? Uh, Caribbean island type stuff. I've been to like uh, Paradise Island in Bahamas, or Hawaii, that type of thing. Sand and sun and some sort of rum drink, right. you know, wherever they serve that stuff. No snow, right? No snow. No snow. No <laughs> snow. How about favorite place you have been? As you, you mentioned, you've been all over the world. What stands out as some place that really was memorable for you? Oh, Tel Aviv. Okay. Oh. Yeah, Tel Aviv, right on the Mediterranean. You know, you watch the sunset over the Med. I told my family, it's like Manhattan on the beach. I got gotcha. you. Beautiful weather. Hawaii's cool. There's so many nice locations. But I pick out Tel Aviv was just, it was, it was not what I expected until I got there. It was really nice. That's awesome, man. How about pets? Dogs, cats, other? What do you so like? Pets is funny. I just uh, I had a, I had a 100-pound husky that I had for about 17 years, passed recently. The dog never barked, it was awesome. awesome. Now, I have two Shih Tzus that, that together don't weigh 20 pounds and they don't stop barking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They have personalities, that's for sure. Oh my God. Uh, I tell you, no one's sneaking into this house with those little dogs, whereas with the Husky, it would lead you to the refrigerator. Or right, oh, right. <laughs> How about like the last question in the lightning round? You 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 go, you're taking your wife out on a date, something that you enjoy, you enjoy doing. What are you guys doing that night? Where are you going? What are you doing? So, you know, this goes back to our first date when I first met her. I tried to impress her. I took her to a steak and sushi house, and then I got surprised because I ended up with a four hundred dollar bill, <laughs> which I was not expecting that for two. But it was a steak and sushi place on the water. Right? So it was really nice. On Long Island, I guess it would have been better if it was in the Caribbean, but it was on Long Island. And we pretty much every year on our anniversary, we go back to that place. But that's the ideal. Steak and sushi on a waterfront restaurant. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. You crushed the lightning round, Vic. So you did a great job. Great job with that, man. It's been a lot of fun to get to know you. And you shared so much with our listeners and we call it Eco Ask Why Vix. I, I'm not going to let you escape without this one. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is all about your passion, man. So, what would be your personal why? There's a saying in aviation lore. And the saying is, you know, being a professional pilot is a lot like being a professional athlete. You know, when you're a professional athlete, you're always like one injury away from ending your career, right? Right. right? Well, in a similar way, when you're a professional pilot, you're always like one medical checkup away from a career-ending diagnosis. So you have to have a backup plan, right? You know, my backup plan was engineering. I told you I always wanted to be a pilot. You know, as a kid, I, there was no, never anything else on my radar. You know, but in high school, I realized that I had the aptitude to be an engineer. So I'm glad I did the pilot thing. got that out of my system. 
I enjoy engineering or solving problems. I enjoy sales because it's high risk, high reward. I mean, you're being rewarded proportionally to your effort level, no cap. And I like marketing. So when you put them all together, engineering, sales, and marketing, it's like fishing, right? You, you got to find the fish. Maybe you chum, use the right bait, build a custom lure, you catch the fish, you reel it in. And then what do you do next? You do it all over again. Right. right. Nonstop. <laughs> Nonstop. So, you know, when I look at it like that, it's just like back in the day when I was hanging out with my dad, just, you know, as a kid in the boat. That's cool, man. That's cool. Well, Vic, this has been a blast. You're a great guest. You know, thank you for playing us with, with the uh, lightning round too, and for giving us some more insight. And man, you're done phenomenal things in your career, and, and definitely one of our heroes. So thank you for taking the time to share with us on Eco Ask Why. Thank you, Chris. I loved it. Appreciate it. Absolutely. You have a great day. You too. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. <laughs>